seated. Let's one more time welcome Jennifer Beckham to Berea, Kentucky today. Thank you, Pastor Hobbs, Sister Hobbs, for allowing me to be here and, and welcoming me uh, into your pulpit. I know that that is a very, very big deal. Um, I know that to stand behind the sacred desk, um, that a pastor would like his pulpit on Sunday morning. So I appreciate that very, very much. And, um, and I'm excited to be here. I know that um, I don't want to keep you all beyond, I don't know, I'm usually good for an hour and a half, two hours. So if everybody's good for that. Is everybody ready? Prepared for that? Okay, good. Um, some of you are like, man, I knew I shouldn't have come today. I want to share my testimony with you if I could. And if, and if it's all right, I want to come down there with you. Um, I was sharing with uh, Sister Hobbs in the front. I said, if, I, if my husband and I ever become pastors and we ever build a church as gorgeous as yours is absolutely beautiful, um, the only thing that I would do differently is I'd make a runway out here because I don't know how to stay up there. And so I, I apologize now in advance for being down here. But my heart is with you, and I hope that you know that through what I'm going to be bringing today, that uh, as I bring forth the message that I believe that God would have for Berea Church of God, I want you to know that um, I'm going to warn you now, I don't know how to write a sermon to save my life, okay? We're just going to throw that out there. You're going to find that out here very, very quickly. But what I do know how to do is I know how to get into the Word for myself so that the Word would heal me and deliver me of my own issues, Amen. <laughs> And I know how it is to get in there and to dig out truth and in the midst of digging out truth, finding yourself in God. And so that's really all I know how to do is bring forth what he's given me for me. You know, when I was saved, um, I'll, I'll share the, this brief word of testimony with you and then we'll get into the word because I want you to kind of understand where I'm coming from as I speak to you today. Um, I, I, I didn't get my ministerial training, so to speak, from, from seminary. I got it from, um, from Disney, actually. I really did, and uh, I'll tell you kind of how that happened. I was raised Catholic all of my life. I was raised in a Catholic home. I was raised with wonderful Catholic parents, and um, uh, we weren't holiday Catholics. We were actually there every Sunday, and uh, no matter where we were on Saturday night, we were always back home on Sunday to go to church with the family, and so it was always very important and always part of our lives, but in the midst of all of that, somewhere I di it didn't resonate with me that there was a God in heaven that loved me. What I got... What I got, and now listen, you don't have to be Catholic or any other denomination or abomination or whatever you want to call it in order to get this, okay? I need you to understand this, that you can be anywhere and get what I'm about to tell you. I had a... I had religion with God. What I imagined God to be was this big God that was up in heaven on his throne, just as frustrated with me as I was with myself. My idea of God was this God that was just throwing up his hands constantly and going, oh, there she goes again. My idea of God was this God that didn't necessarily love me, that just tolerated me. That's kind of where I was with God. And even though I had been raised in church all of my life, and even, even though I had gone to a Catholic school, I knew all the things I was supposed to know, but I never really truly knew the love of God. I never understood the grace of God. And so it wasn't until I was working for the Disney Corporation, you see it the very, in a very nutshell for you this morning, at the age of seven, I had a dream at Disney that I wanted to be a Disney princess. She, Cinderella went by in her stagecoach, and I, you know, this is going to sound cheesy to some of you men, but the women will appreciate this at least. At the age of seven, I looked up at my mom when I looked at Cinderella in her stagecoach, and I said, Mom, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be a Disney princess. I kind of tucked that dream away in my heart, and I didn't go through every day of my life saying, oh, I want to be a princess. Not like that at all. I played softball all my life. Trust me, I belong more in cleats on a softball field than I do in high heels behind a pulpit, okay? So I fake it well, all right? But really, I was raised all of my life doing that, believing that one day I would get to Disney because that is a magical place. And if I could ever work there and get on top of a float, I'd feel good about me. I'd have everything Cinderella would have, the Prince Charming, the Fairy Godmother to poof my problems away. You, are, you with me? Birds and mice coming out of the woodwork to do my chores for me. Okay, some of you are with me on that one. Okay. So that's kind of what I thought that it would be once I finally got there, and it wasn't. As a matter of fact, by the time I had gotten to my float, 
my dream was more like a nightmare because by that time I had already had several tragedies happen in my life in family matters and then also in the midst of a tragedy instead of dealing with the death of my father dying of cancer and all of those things I started running into things into relationships into looking for love in wrong places by the time I got up on top of that float I was broken I was miserable and I hated me when I looked in the mirror I saw everything that was wrong with me not what was right with me and Disney didn't help they were always telling me that I wasn't skinny enough perfect enough pretty enough whatever enough and so I kind of never measured up so when I finally got on top of that float I just went continually looking for love in wrong places and it wasn't until I was there in Japan I was actually hired on to be Cinderella Snow White Mary Poppins Belle and Sleeping Beauty that's what I was hired to do at Disney they paid me to do that and that great no clue why they chose me and I always say it when you put blonde hair on this brown skin I just look like a Puerto Rican Cinderella okay but for some reason, they saw something in me. Who knows? But I was going to take their paycheck anyways, all right? I wasn't going to argue with them. So I got my job, and it was all wonderful and good. But the greatest part of it was this. I know now why God had me there in Japan or working for Disney and then going over to Japan. When I was hired on to go to Tokyo Disneyland, I was in a foreign country with nobody for almost nine months of my life at the age of 18. And... Um, just wrapped up with all of the entertainment world and I was lost I was absolutely lost and so as I laid there in my bed there in in Tokyo Japan I didn't really know how to pray because I didn't know a God that was listening to me but there were two little Baptist girls on cast with me that one day we all went into work and we were working together doing the morning shift together and I was in Cinderella that day and my Mary Poppins and my um, and my Wendy all convinced me to go to Billy Graham crusade how many times do you have Mary Poppins and Wendy convince you to go to a Billy Graham crusade? So they had me go to a Billy Graham crusade, and I said, oh, I don't want to do that. I said, isn't he a preacher? You know, I didn't even know really who he was. I just knew I saw him on TV preaching. And um, so they said, yeah, we'll go with me, and they did what we do at church. You know, we offer people food, and they come out, right? Well, they offered me food. And so I said, yeah, I'll absolutely go with you. So I did, and, and uh, long story short, I stood there in the Tokyo Dome in Japan, I don't know how many hundreds upon thousands of people can be seated in that auditorium, but I know that when Billy Graham was preaching and he was giving forth that message of salvation about a God that loves us and a, and a Jesus that bridges the gap between a God that I feared all of my life and me. And when I heard that and I understood the love of God for the very first time, I went down and I gave my heart to the Lord. I actually had to find a post in the ground with English written on it so that somebody in my own language in Japan could lead me to the Lord. And that's where I found him. That's kind of where Jesus stuck his foot out and let, him, let me know that he was there all along. I just didn't know it. And so uh, anyways, I came back home to the States. And I was praying for my place, didn't know what God would want me to do. And it was about three years later that I was working for a marketing company. Um, didn't get involved in church, didn't really get plugged into the word, and as a result of that, ended up going back into a lot of the, the gross things of my life, and it became a lot worse. I was laying in a borrowed bed in Tampa looking up, and I said, God, I don't know if you remember me. I met you in Japan. And if you can hear me, and if you love me like I felt like you did that night, then I need your help. I'm asking you to send me an angel. Guys, please clarify your prayers very, very much. Clarify your prayers. I said, Lord, I need an angel to come into my business and change my marketing business. I need your help. I need your help. And so I laid there in a borrow bed in Tampa, looked up and prayed for an angel. Two weeks later, I met a man named Anthony who was a Church of God preacher called to evangelize. I was trying to recruit him into marketing, and he was trying to recruit me back to Jesus because he could see how devastatingly lost I still was. Apparently, he was much better in sales than I was because he won. And um, we married eight weeks later. Yeah, eight weeks later. So I always tell people, you can be eight weeks away from marriage, so don't worry about it. Now, that's only if you're over the age of 25. Don't be getting any ideas on me, all right? Amen? Does that, does that help you out? You're welcome. You're, you're absolutely welcome. Mamas, I helped you out too, didn't I? But listen, if you're really just feeling like you're just going to spend the rest of your life single, look, you could be eight weeks away from marriage. Just chill out and relax and let God take care of it, all right? But he was a, an evangelist, and I was a heathen, and God only knows why he saw something in me. But he saw enough of God in me buried deep beneath all the junk that he was able to have enough of God in him to keep me from running and to pull some of that out and to be able to hold me down when I absolutely needed it. 
So I want you to know that I stand before this pulpit and I didn't have any idea that God would ever call me to preach. As a matter of fact, my place, as far as I was concerned, was sitting in the front row yelling amen at all the right times that my husband needed me to. As far as I was concerned, I was going to fix his eyebrows, pick the lint out of his hair, and fix his tie before he got to the pulpit. That was what I was going to do, and feed him, because he eats like six times a day, and then even in the middle of the night, you'd see him, big guy. So I knew my place, I thought I knew my place, and I was praying and fasting for about six months, asking the Lord, just, where is my place? What do you want me to do? Because I believe that when God calls one, he calls the other. And I was praying and fasting, and about six months later, I had gotten an answer in a very strange way. I woke up on a Wednesday morning, ran out into the living room, got paper because I had some thoughts going through my mind, and in the matter, literally in the matter of five minutes, I had ten pages worth of notes just writing on, on paper. And I looked at it, and I thought, I know what this is. This is, this is a sermon. So I got up and I ran in the other room and I jumped on my husband's bed at 4 o'clock in the morning and I said, I got it. I got my answer from God. I got my place in the ministry. He rolled over and he said, what is it? And I said, I'm going to write the sermons and you're going to preach them. <laughs> and that's exactly what I thought that I would do and I, I promise you that's how that transpired. He laughed at me the way you just did and I appreciate that. And he said, baby, I can't preach that message. And of course I got defensive, well why not? Is it not good enough? Can I not write your sermons? And he said, no baby, because if God gave you that message, then you're gonna preach it. And I said, <laughs> oh no, no, no. I said, no, 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 I'm not a preacher. And so he says, well, you're gonna preach it if the Lord opens the doors. And I said, fine, I know how to fix this. I won't tell anybody I wrote a sermon. You don't tell anybody I wrote a sermon, we're good. And I know he didn't tell because he likes to actually sleep in the bed with me instead of on the couch in the living room. So he didn't tell, and, and I didn't tell, but God told on me. And we were working underneath a pastor doing some youth pastoring work during the week while we were evangelizing on the weekends. And that pastor, Brother Blazer, down in, in Lake Placid, Florida, walked straight up to me, and he said, I believe that the Lord's given you something you've got next Wednesday night's message. Didn't ask me. He told me. He turned around, walked away, left me standing there. And at that moment in time, I got on my face before the Lord, and I said, God... I'm scared to death, but if you gave me a message, I will preach it, and I didn't know how else to pray, but this is what I said. I said, God, if you give me messages, I'll preach them, but when you stop, I stop. And it's been about 10 years now, and he has yet to stop, and this message that he brought to me was for a time in my life where I was riding off of the coattails of my husband. You see, I'd gotten saved under my husband's ministry, so to speak. I got saved and delivered from my issues because he brought me to the Lord, a loving God that I met in Japan but never got an opportunity to really hang out with and get to know so that he could save me and deliver me from my issues. And so I was saved under him, and so most of the time, I, like many of us, ride the coattails of somebody else's faith. And it was a couple of years into it where God really woke me up in the middle of the night and he asked me a question. He said, why are you saved? And I said, well, I'm saved because you love me. No answer. Because I'm cute and you want to spend eternity with me? I didn't have the answer. I didn't have the answer for that. I said, well, because you want everybody saved. That's what your word says, that you desire that all should come to repentance. So that's why you saved me. And he really questioned me. And he brought me to the word and he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get into my word and I want you to find every time where grace was applied to somebody's life. You see, according to me, according to what I knew, coming into church and having no clue about what to do, how to act, or who even Jonah was, all I knew was that God did something miraculous in my life, and I used church words really well, like some of you. I used words like grace all the time. I used words like sanctification, having no clue what they actually meant. I was real good with my church lingo, but had no clue what it did in my life and how it really manifested itself for me. So God brought me to the Word, and He said, I want you to know why you're saved. I want you to know why it is that I looked down and I chose you. Because salvation is a gift from God. So there was a reason why God imparted that gift to me. And if you're saved here in this building this morning, there's a reason he imparted it to you. And even though you look beautiful this morning, it's not just because you're cute. And because he wants to spend eternity with you in heaven. There's a purpose that grace 
is applied to your life and to mine. So we're going to do that. Would you take out your Bibles with me? Let's go to Ephesians 2 and let's break this thing open and see why it is that God saved us. You see, because it's not just enough that we would say, I thank you, God, that I'm saved. I thank you, God, that you gave me the gift of salvation. It's not enough to just say, I've got it. I've got my ticket. I'm, I'm ready. What's more is to look at our lives and to say, Lord, why would you choose me? What is it that I have in my life that you have deposited within me that you want deposited into this world? So I want to talk to you this morning about that. And you'll have to, again, excuse me for um, my lack of polish, if you will. Because all I know how to do is to bring you what God brings me and what tra changed and transformed my life. So let's go ahead and look at Ephesians 2 and 8 is where you're going this morning. Are y'all with me? Amen. Pastor, again, thank you for your, your pulpit this morning and for this time with your people. I don't take that lightly at all. Uh, Ephesians 2 and 8 through 10, are you there? Amen. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, what we do, and you can keep your Bibles on your lap because we're going to do some flipping this morning. Flipping's good for us, right? Some of us haven't flipped in a little while, so we're going to do that. So we're going to look into the Word and see what it is that grace was for because it wasn't just to get us out of our messes. You see, my idea of what grace was for was that grace was something that, was, that is, is something that God applies to your life when you and I get ourselves into trouble. <laughs> Grace was always something to me that, that God did for us to get us out of the junk and out of the messes and out of the fixes that we put ourselves in. And it's great because, you know, when I came into the church, I used to hear people say, oh, grace, it's the unmerited favor of God. You can't buy it. It's just by the grace. It's just by the gifting of God that he applied it to our lives. So I got to really looking at that. And I found out that if you go a little further into what grace is tr truly is, it is God's it's, it's God touching your heart, and then there's always something that is manifested in your life. It's not just something that he gives you to get you out of things. Grace is the unmerited favor of God, but it's also God's divine influence on our lives, and then there's a reflection that should be in our life. If you've ever seen anybody come to an altar and give their heart to the Lord and then get up, and go back out into their life and they're exactly the same, chances are they did what 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2 says, and that is that they received their grace in vain. Chances are they came to an altar, they were feeling bad about what happened last night, last week, last year, and they came down and got, pardon me, a little snotty around an altar and thought that that was just going to fix things. And you know what? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, Paul is beseeching his readers and he says, please don't receive your grace in vain. There was always a reason for grace to be applied to somebody's life. We're going to walk through grace in our lives. We're going to walk through different types of grace that is in our life because I'm here today to tell you that there is a purpose for grace. There is a reason why you are saved today and why I am saved today. There is something that not God, not only does God want to get us through, but he wants to get something through us into the world. Are you with me? So let's take a look at some different types of grace, if we could. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's see what it looks like when grace is not taken for granted and not taken in vain. Let's go to Acts 9. Let's flip there. Most of you know why I flipped into Acts 9. If you know the Word of God, you know that in here, in Acts 9, we see the story of a, a man by the name of Saul. And the amazing thing is, is he had a touch of grace, or a grace package, if you will, that got sent to him from heaven. And that grace package was enough for him to open it up, and it changed him so much that his name changed. So we're going to look at what it looks like when grace is not received in vain, but it's received for its intended purpose. Okay? We're going to look at that. Acts 9, 1 through 2, let's take a look at who Saul was in his pre-grace state. Okay? What I mean by pre-grace state is before grace visited his life, he was one way. Hopefully after grace visits your life, you should be another. And I don't necessarily mean it has to be instantaneous. What I mean by that is that there's a process of change, but there's a revelation of, oh God, I understand you're saving me because you need something from me. There's something you deposited in me upon my birth, upon me being formed in my mother's womb, that you need to get out into this world. So let's take a look at that. Acts 9, 1 and 2. Then Saul 
still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any there who were of the way, whether men or women, that he may bring them bound to Jerusalem. What he was doing was he was seeking out Christians that were basically fleeing because he was taking them all captive and punishing them for their faith, okay? So he's looking for people who were on that road, who were of the way, so that he can bring them in and be able to do with them. He was zealous. He was overzealous for God. He was angry. He was aggressive. That's who he was before grace visited his life. Now let's go on a little bit further. As he journeyed, he came near to Maskins, and suddenly, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads or against the pricks. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and if you are marking anything in your Bibles or taking notes, please go ahead and mark this. And when the eyes were open, he saw no one. He was blind, okay? But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days without sight he neither ate nor drank. So basically what we have is this. Paul or Saul is going down the Damascus road, and he's going to do what he thinks is right. He's got his attitude problem. He's got his zealousness. He thinks that everything he's doing is a good thing and it's for God. And then all of a sudden, as he's there on that Damascus road, out from heaven, he gets a FedEx. He gets a FedEx from heaven that basically knocks him off of his horse and blinds him for three days. How many of you realize that would get your attention too? So grace, what we're going to talk about today are these things, what I like to call grace packages. It's when grace is applied to your life and mine and it gets our attention, or at least it should. It knocked him off of his horse, and here's the thing. God had a plan, a reason, something that God wanted to do in his life. And how do we know that? This is what the Bible says in verse 15 when he spoke to Ananias and said, Go to this man that will be praying, and I'm going to tell you what to tell him. And this is what he said in verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, he said to Ananias, for he is my chosen vessel. To bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. Verse 16, for I will show him, speaking of Saul, how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, let me go ahead and break this down for you because you know what? I have, I have a problem sometimes with scripture understanding what's going on unless I can put them in um, my seven-year-old and my four-year-old's language. So I'm going to do that for you. Is that all right with you? I'm not going to talk like a baby. Don't worry. It's going to be like, she's weird. Saul was on that Damascus road and he got a FedEx from heaven. Knocked him off his horse. And my guess is, is that grace package that God was trying to send to him, that was not his first grace package he was ever trying to send. You see, God always deals with you in private before he ever deals with you in public. So according to the scripture, there was probably many instances in his life where God had sent already conviction. And he threw it away, threw it over his shoulder and didn't bother with it much. And if you don't listen to conviction, and if I don't listen to conviction, eventually God will find a way to get our attention, and it may just be knocking us off of our horse and sending us a bigger grace package in the form of a three-day blindness, which we'll get to in a minute. But what happens is, is if he would have done what he was supposed to do in that day because he was blind for three days, he finally got a clue, he would have understood that if you will open up the grace packages in your life, there will always be change. When grace is applied to your life and mine, we're supposed to open it up and figure out, oh God, I get it. You've applied your grace to my life in this instance because there's something I'm supposed to learn in this moment for change. Are you with me? So far, so good. If you're a parent, you've watched your children go down to that Christmas tree and go into those presents and start ripping them open like nobody's business. You've watched them go through 10 presents probably, or at least five presents in a matter of 0.2 seconds. You've watched them take it and dig into it and rip it open and look at the presents go, oh, that's great, and throw it over their shoulder and keep going. And you as a parent are thinking, $50, $100, $200, right? And you're thinking, what is he looking for? I thought 
thought he wanted the first one and the second one. You see, you and I, we get ourselves into situations and then we pray for God's grace. God's grace comes and what we do with grace is this. This is how we receive it in vain. God's grace is applied to a situation, gets us out of our mess, and we go, thank you, Jesus, for your grace. We stand up in a little testimony service and praise God for his grace and then go right about, on about our ways being the ways that we've always been. Are you with me? So let's take a look at some of those types of grace so that we get the idea today that where grace has been applied to our lives, there was supposed to be a lesson to be learned in that moment, and there was supposed to be a change in our character because that's all God cares about is our character, not our comfort, our character. Are you with me? So let's go ahead and do this. Let's break some things down. Let's go to, um, let's go to destiny grace in Luke 2 and 40. Some of you say these graces are in the Bible, never read them. Luke 2 and 40, and if you're marking your Bibles, you can go ahead and mark this one. I'll go ahead and read for sake of time. I'm going to keep going. Is that all right with you? Luke 2 and 40, and the child grew and became strong in spirit. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. When the Lord brought me and said, listen, you've got to go to the Word, and you've got to find every time where grace was applied to somebody's life, because I want you to see a pattern. When grace was applied to somebody's life, there was a change in their life. I did something with their life. There was a purpose for me doing that. And so right here what we have is what I like to call destiny grace because it says that destiny grace or grace was applied to Jesus' life when he was upon this earth and it was for good purpose. It was obviously so that he could come die upon a cross so that you and I could have our destinies today in him. We find out Noah had grace in the eyes of God, Moses and Joseph. They all had a reason. For Moses, it was to change the destiny of all of mankind. For Moses, it was to change the destiny of God's people. And for Joseph, it was to change the destiny of his family. And with that said, I want to share with you this. If you're here today and you're the only one where grace has been applied to your life, you're the only one saved, then that means that grace was applied to you in the midst of your heathen family. That means that sometimes you leave church and you've got to go home to hell on earth inside your home. It also means that if you're here today and you're saved and grace has been applied to your life, not only do you have your ticket from he to heaven, that's wonderful, but you may be saying, God, why is it that you would save me and then leave me here in this job with all of these heathens where I can't read the Bible and they're all sinners? And they don't respect me in my faith. Lord, why would you leave me here? And all I want to do today is maybe just give you a different perspective, maybe from the throne. Because perhaps he applied destiny grace to your life because you are in a home full of heathens. Perhaps he saved you out of the midst of them. And I always really wonder why it is that we get ourselves in situations, God applies His grace to our lives, and the first thing that we want to do is pray for a way out. What if we all just stayed put right where we are, hung on to the grace He gave us that gets us through, that the Bible says is sufficient for us, and what if we stayed put long enough where we forgot about ourselves just for a moment, and we realized that the grace that was applied to our lives is not for us at all? Perhaps it is for that father, that uncle, that brother, that boss. Perhaps destiny grace was applied to your life because you're actually supposed to make a difference where you are. So oftentimes we find ourselves on a hospital bed somewhere. And all we do is we lay in that hospital bed and all we can do is get so caught up with us. Lord, why am I here? Lord, you know the bills that are going to be because of this. And Lord, you know that we can't afford this. And Lord, this is not a good timing. And Lord, if I'm out of work, I may not get, you know, I may get fired from my job. And we lay there in our beds and we say, God, why? But what if we learn to just say, God, show me why I'm here. Instead of God, get me out of here. How about God, while I'm here, what is it that I have inside this hospital that I can offer for the guy in the next bed, for the nurse that comes with a broken home? What if I got over myself long enough to be able to understand that grace was applied to my life for a purpose, not just to get me through, but to get something through me? Are you with me? Let's look at people grace. 
I love people grace, and you can find it in Luke 2 and 52, and you can go there if you would. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I love this because really what it's saying is that Jesus had people grace. He was one of those people that when he walked down a street, people followed him. Did you know that if you're one of those people that lights up a room when you walk into it? Did you know that if you're one of those people when you walk into a room, everybody knows your name? Did you know that if you, that's you, it's not just so you can look in the mirror and say, I'm popular, people like me. Oh, come on, lighten up, you can laugh. If for nothing else other than I look stupid doing it. Did you know that people grace was not applied to your life? So when you're a teenager, you can get a crown on your head and say, I'm homecoming queen. People like me. I'm pretty. Did you know that when people grace is applied to your life, it's not just so you can walk through your life and say, yes, thank you, God. People like me, I have friends. Perhaps maybe God applied people grace to your life to set you up a platform so you can bring him. Perhaps if you're one of those people where your face lights up a room, then here's what I need you to understand before you leave today. You may never have me back. I may never step foot in this building. But my heart and my desire is that the empty chairs would be filled with people, with sinners. And with people that love God that have just been hurt inside a church. And they can walk in to some real people that will love them the real way. So my heart is for that. And in, and in saying that, this is what I need you to understand about your people grace. If you're a people grace person where people just love you, they just like you and they don't know why. They're the kind of people like my husband that can't walk into a gym in Chicago with my brother who's lived there for three years. I'll never forget, we go up there, and he's not in Chicago living there anymore, but we go up, we were going up every uh, summer for uh, three or four years when he was there. He lived in Lincoln Park, and, and he worked at the um, Bank of America building, so they had, on the bottom there, they had a huge gym that they would work out in, and it was for all of the, you know, corporate people that worked in the building, and so they would go and work out. And my brother had lived there for two years, went to that gym four days a week, every week of his life for two years. My husband goes up there, and I'm at home with the kids, and he goes in to work out with my brother. And upon leaving, 45 minutes later, because my husband just gets in and out, he doesn't make a wonderful social event of it, thank God. And he goes in and goes out 45 minutes later, and as he's leaving the front doors with my brother, the people in the gym, some of the members of the gym were turning around saying, hey, Anthony, nice to meet you, man, see you tomorrow. My brother turns to my husband and says, Dude, I've been coming here for two years. Nobody knows my name, and none of them care to see me tomorrow. What is your deal? And my husband smiled, and he said, it's people grace. He said, God gives you people grace so that wherever you go, you might be able to attract people to you. You see, now I can tell by the look on your face, some of you are not people grace people. <laughs> and don't worry, we may get to your grace here in just a minute. If you're happy, let your face know it sometimes. You know what I'm saying? So that's not your gifting, but for the ones that are laughing at me, maybe it is for you, so there is hope will go on. How do you not receive your people grace in vain? Very simply, you find the doors of a church, and you plant yourself there, and you smile your little people grace face happy with every individual that walks through that door. You find a way to, no matter where you go, when people look at you and say, wow, you've got the greatest smile. You just look so happy. You take that opportunity to say, thank you. You know what? You look gorgeous today. I just want to let you know Jesus loves you. Don't do it the way I would do it. Don't do it the way pastor would do it. Do it in your own personality. You don't have to be anybody but you. Just find your own way. But if God has blessed you with the ability to draw a crowd, then you better use it, honey, or else you've received your grace in vain. I'm going to go on. <laughs> Attitude grace. I'm going to run through a couple of these very, very quickly because they're really self-explanatory. Galatians 1, 13 through 16, if you're taking notes. Basically what this is is that we have to understand that there, I guess the best way to understand this one is this. We take grace, as I said before, we get ourselves into situations and we expect that God's grace will get us out of them and then we just go, thank you, Lord, for getting me out. 
And one of the ways we do that is sometimes we run our mouths. We gossip, but we don't call it that. We call it sharing because that's the church word for it, right? Did you get that? We share with each other. Sister, let me share with you that brother so-and-so is sleeping with sister so-and-so. I share that with you only because we need to pray. Yeah. Lots of prayer going on. So what we find here is we find ourselves getting ourselves in a situation. Now, you know and I know that if you're a sharer, then it's only a matter of time before it bites you where you don't want it to. Because people will begin to figure out that if you do it to other people, you're probably doing it to me. And sooner or later, you will find yourself with no friends. And this is, I think, what we do with grace the best, is we get ourselves in these situations. We, we lose friends. People start avoiding us. It seems like everybody's against us. And then we have the audacity to sit in our bedrooms and say, Lord, you see what's going on here. And God, I just pray your grace in this situation because this is not how it's supposed to be and this is not what I intended. And so miraculously, thinking that we've learned our lesson, God goes ahead, applies his grace to the situation, gets us out of it, and the first thing that we do is get up right where we're at, say, Phew. Thank you, God. I totally knew that you could work it out. And then we go back to sharing again. And then the second time around when the pastor pulls you aside and says, Hey, honey. Not hey, honey. Probably not. No. Yeah. He's a very smart man. He goes up to her and he pulls her aside, of course, with another man in the room and says, You need to stop running your mouth. You're creating problems. And then she has the audacity to go back to her husband and her family at home and slice and dice the pastor and say, can you believe that he would correct me that way? And yet, it's all our doing. And the first grace package was nice. It was God trying to get our attention. The second grace package, because God loves us and wants to make sure that we are free from the issues that keep us from offering Jesus to other people, then he sent a pastor. And if we don't listen to it there and we throw that package over our shoulder, it'll come around somewhere again. You see, so at some point we need, need to understand that we need to open up that box and realize that God's trying to change us. Because God's grace is not just to get us through things, but to get something through us. So let's move on again to beauty grace. We find out that there is something called beauty grace. We find that out in Esther 5. If you're a pretty person in this room, just thank God for making you pretty and just realize it ain't about you. Amen? Amen. Because I've been told that being beautiful is not such a hot thing anyways. I've been told. That you lose friends, that you're very misunderstood, that people don't like you, that women always hate you. And you know what? Sometimes you sit in your room and you say, God, what did you do this for? What did you make me this way for? And I want you to know that sometimes God gives you beauty. And it's not about you and it's not for a crown and it's not for any other reason for you to say that maybe perhaps it opens doors for me where it doesn't open for other people. And maybe it's just for one thing so I can bring Jesus through that door. It's not about you. The next thing is traveling grace. I'm going to run through this one quickly because I think this is pretty self-explanatory. How many of you have ever prayed for traveling grace and mercy when you got into a car? This is how distorted we do with grace. If we pray for traveling grace and mercy, we buckle up our seatbelts and we say, Lord, getting on the road. Traveling grace and mercy, Lord. We pull out of our driveways, we go down the street, we get onto the highway, we merge onto 95 or whatever your highway is here. I'm from Florida. Everything's 95 or 75 down there. What's your highway? 75, right on. So you merge on to 75 and you've prayed for traveling grace and mercy and you're buckled up and you get onto that highway, you start hitting the pedal, the speed limit sign says 70 and you go 85. But you've prayed for grace, so God will get you through. Come on guys, that's not what grace is for, are you with me? So we go down the street breaking all the rules, mind you, and all of a sudden we see red and blue lights behind us. And then have the audacity to say, oh, God, you know that I can't afford this ticket. I won't be able to pay my tithe. 
Sorry, I just had to throw that part in there. All right, good word. So we get on the side of the road, and there he is, that police officer. We have any cops in the building today? Any policemen? Any law enforcement officers? That's good, because this is here. This is the deal. They saunter. They sit back there, and they make us sweat. I know they do. For 20 minutes, they're just hanging out, twiddling their thumbs. They could come to our window and get it over with, but they want to see us sweat, right? So we're sitting on the side of the road. He's back there and doing whatever he's doing. He finally gets to our window about 20 minutes later. We roll down our window and we look over with our people grace face and say, hi, officer, thinking that's going to get us out, right? So there he is and he goes ahead and takes our information and he goes back into the back. And some of us that haven't prayed in a very long time or prayed in the Spirit in an even longer time get all spiritual and just start praying in the Spirit right there. Lord, get me through. Get me out of this. And then when that officer comes up with the ticket, we say, God, I thought that you'd handle this. And you see, my perspective from heaven that, the God, that God showed me was this. What if that... $240 ticket that you just got is your grace package. What if, if you would just open up that grace package and see that that $240 is far better than the accident that awaits you around the next corner? Perhaps this is what God's trying to get us to do is to slow down here so we don't get hurt there. You see, if you're here today and you're in sin today, perhaps this message is the grace package that God is sending you to say, get out now. Because I know what's awaiting you around the next corner. Don't play games with God. Please don't receive your grace in vain. He loves you too much to send a little Jacksonville, Florida girl to here, to Kentucky, to let you know that he will deal with you in private before he deals with you in public. Please open up the package and understand that he doesn't want you where you're at. Not because he's a dictator, but because he loves you. Open up the package. The next one is traveling grace. And then we look at healing grace. We find out in Mark 5 that the demoniac came down. He was healed of Je by Jesus. And what did he want to do? You can read that in your own time in Mark 5. But he came to Jesus and he said, can I go with you? And what did Jesus say? He said, no, stay here and go back to your family. Go back to the people that knew you in bondage so that they could see what grace is all about. Did you know that God didn't apply healing grace? How many of you have ever been healed? Cancer, toe ache, headache, anything. Have you ever noticed that when we're healed of something in that moment, it's like, thank you, God. We stand up and, testi and testify and we thank the Lord for it, but then something happens. After about a week, we forget. We forget, don't we? And I want to submit to you something. If not today, I want you to remember this every Sunday for the rest of your life, if there are ever people ailing at an altar. Perhaps God applied healing grace to your life because your faith was elevated for healing. And the next time that somebody comes to an altar hurting, in pain, ailed in body, if you sit with your healing grace on your pew and you do not get up from where you are and take your healing grace and your faith that was lifted when you were healed and come down and lay hands on somebody that needs healing, then you've received your grace in vain. Because it wasn't just because he loved you that he healed you. It's because he wants to get something through you into the world. And there are people around you and me that are hurting all the time. And if you don't get up and apply your healing grace to somebody else's life, you received it in vain. You missed the point. Money grace. Oh, don't go there. I must. That's in the Bible, Luke 8. We find out that Mary Magdalene and other women ministered unto Jesus out of their substance. That means that they had something to give. I don't know where they got it. Don't care to know. Doesn't matter. The fact is... Let me, let me wrap all this up in a nutshell for you. What if, what if God looking down from his throne looked down and had a plan like we know he does? But what if God looked down on that very day when Jesus was coming through town? 
And in his grand scheme of things, the whole idea is this. What if God looked down and he saved Mary Magdalene for her money? Are you telling me that God saved me to get to my money? It very could be, yes. Mm -hmm. What if God, now just follow me just for a moment because I think a little differently. You figured that out already. And we're going to go ahead and close, but I want you to understand this. What if God looked down and he said, you, Mary Magdalene, I'm going to save you, I'm going to deliver you, and I'm going to change you. Because Jesus is coming into town. And in order to get his ministry through this earth, I need people like you. I need your substance. Because I know that if you're changed and if you get the point of grace, you're going to take what I've already given you. You just never really gave me credit for giving it to you. You're going to take what I've already given to you, what I've already allotted to you in this life, and you're going to turn it over to my Jesus so that it can forward the ministry. And what if he's looking down and he says, Mary Magdalene, I'm going to save and change your life because I need your money. And what if he looks over at somebody else and he says, and I'm going to heal you because I need you to be there when my Jesus comes through town, and I need you laying hands on other people so that they're healed. And what if he looked over and he said, and you with your people grace, I need you to be there so that you could attract more people on the scene. And what if he looked over at somebody else? Do you understand? That what if all of us are saved because there's something that he deposited within us that he needs to get out of us to advance the kingdom? So if you sit here today and you're financially able and blessed, and there is a need, and I understand that there are a lot of needs that come your way when you're financially able. But when God lays it on your heart to advance the kingdom, and you are sitting there on your money grace, you've received it in vain. You've missed the point. Now this last point is where I'm going before I close. Sometimes we receive grace packages that we don't like to get. I remembered, uh, in the beginning, I remember I told you to mark your Bibles about Saul's three-day blindness, right? For Saul, that three-day blindness was enough to get his full attention and to say, I surrender. You see, if you don't open the grace packages of conviction, God loves you too much to let you go. And if you don't receive the conviction parts, and you don't, receive the in private parts, then he'll find you a way to knock you off your horse and make you blind for three days so you have God's attention. God has your attention. For Saul, it was a three-day blindness. For others of you, it was getting caught in the act of adultery. For others of us, it has been in deep, dark situations that God is trying to get our attention for some of you, you look pretty today on the outside, but my guess is that some of you have walked through some stuff that you don't want anybody to know about. One of the things that God had to show me was that some of the greatest gifts in my life are not the pretty gifts of the ability to speak or the ability to meet with people or the ability to fellowship and have people grace. God has shown me that some of the greatest gifts in my life come from my pain. For me, some of the greatest things that reaches people is the junk of where I used to be. And I want you to hear me this morning because for some of you, the areas where grace was applied to your life to get you through a situation that almost leveled you, knocked your knees out from under you, and took everything away from you is exactly where God wants to use you. I want you to go and I want you to mark your scriptures and take this with you. This is my last point. Go to Hebrews 2 and 9 and 2 and 18. Would you do that with me? Is anybody getting anything out of this this morning? 2 and 9 and 2 and 18. I'm not doing that bad on time. Is everybody still with me? 2 and 9 and 2 and 18. Let's go there quickly, but let it sink into your heart. Don't just skip over it and try to get to the close. 2 and 9 and 2 and 18, understand that when I came to God, I didn't have pretty gifts to offer. I had been looking for love in wrong places. I was a bulimic for two and a half years of my life. I wanted to commit suicide. I hated me and everything about me. 
To me, I was just broken. And as broken as I was, I kept trying to find other people to make me whole, and that just made me more broken. It was a vicious cycle that never, ever ended. And you know what? I'm not here today to say, look what I did. Look, I've had people tell me all the time, Sister Jennifer, you ought not talk about your past. It just glorifies the devil. Can I tell you something? That is a crock of garbage. There has never been a day in my life that I have ever talked about my past and had it not been followed up with, but let me tell you who delivered me of that past. I don't glorify the enemy when I talk about where I used to be. As a matter of fact, when I got hired on by Disney, there was one reason I was surprised, very surprised, why they chose me. Because I've got a scar on my forehead. For some of you sitting in the front row, some of you are like, why would you point out your flaws? Oh, honey, I'll give you a list of them if you, if you want to see them after church. I used to try to hide this scar. You see, let me tell you what this scar is. This scar, it literally, it's shaped like a question mark. It says I'm clueless. That's basically what it says. But it's literally a question mark, and here's the point, though. It just didn't line up. When I was three years old, I decided to get under a big Labrador German Shepherd mix to help him eat, as though he had a problem with eating. And at the age of three, I was at my neighbor's house, and I picked up food, and I crawled underneath him, and I decided his name was Drambui. <laughs> it's a good name. And I took a handful of food, and I decided that I would help Drambui eat. The only problem was they also had a little poodle that I didn't know used to sneak under him and steal his food. So at the age of three, I got out there, and I picked up a handful of food, and I looked up. And as I looked up to feed him, he also opened his mouth to come down on me, thinking I was the poodle. And at the age of three, this was his bottom tooth, and this was his top tooth. My entire face was inside that dog's mouth. With a cosmetic surgeon, it took over 75 stitches to close me up on top. But you know what's cool? I'm 33 years old, and there are times that people notice my scar, usually well after they've already known me for a while. And when they walk up to me and they say, oh, where'd you get that scar? You know the first place that I take them to? I take them back to when I was three, and I tell them all about it. I tell them the story just like I just told you the story. Because you see, scars, they're conversation pieces. It tells you where you used to be, and it also tells you that you were healed. You see, scars aren't something to be ashamed of. When I was hired on by Disney, I was amazed that they chose me because I was chosen to be a face character. And the fact that I had a scar on my forehead would show everybody that that princess, Cinderella, is different from that princess, Cinderella. And we were all supposed to be the same. But there was one day in my life that I understood that my scar is not something to be ashamed of, but rather my scar is just a conversation piece. Because I had a fan, believe it or not, we had fans there at Disney. They were all Japanese people and they loved us American girls that would come over and be princesses. They, they wrote us notes, they sent us mail, they would show up at our doorstep. It was strange, a little weird. And they were like 40, even stranger. But this one wonderful woman who was about 40, I was her favorite princess. And I finally got tired of dodging her, so we finally just introduced ourselves, and then she started coming over for like lunch and tea and stuff. And to her, it was the biggest thrill of her life. But the neatest thing that I ever remember is I did look at her across the table and I said, I'm like the least princessy person here out of all these girls. I'm the one that doesn't belong here out of all of them. Why am I your favorite? And she said, because one day the wind blew. See, all of my wigs covered my scar. They made it a point to cover my scar. And all of my wigs covered my scar, but one day she said, the wind blew your wig. And I saw that you had a scar on your forehead, and that's how I could tell it was you. She said, and I realized you're just like me. See, I have a scar. You're just like me. 
And of all the perfect princesses, I was the one she liked the best because I was the one she could identify with. I had scars, and so did she. Hebrews 2 and 9 says this, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, listen to these words, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Did you hear those words? By the grace of God, he tasted death. When I read those words, I said, what? No, God, grace is supposed to be that nice fluffy thing that gets us through life. Death doesn't sound fluffy and nice. He said, by the grace of God, he tasted death for everyone. You see, it is by the grace of God. Sometimes you receive grace packages in the form of death. Sometimes you, you are given grace packages from heaven in the form of hurt and pain in your life. And while you're saying, God, get me out of this, why? God's wanting you to say, just open up the package because... My grace is sufficient enough to get you through this, but in the midst of it, you're being watched. You see, you're going to come out of this on the other end. You're going to come out on the other end of your pornography addiction if you would grab onto the unchanging hand of God and be delivered. And in, as a result of that, you'll be, and I'm talking to women too. Come on, don't men don't look at me going, man, I knew, I knew she was going to step on me. If you would get over to the other side of that thing, and you would open up your package and be changed and delivered and set free from that thing that has kept you in bondage and ruined every relationship. Did you know that in any given church on any given Sunday, over 50% of any congregation is affected with pornography in the home? That's not judgment. That's me giving you a real figure. Do you know what that represents to me? That represents a real ministry waiting to happen. That means that if those men and those women that are in bondage to that would ever reach up and be changed by God, they can go back into a world that is bound with pornography and say, I've been there, I've done that, here's the scar, but let me tell you about the Jesus that healed me. For some of you, you sit here, and did you know, statistically speaking, in any given church, this is inside the church, one out of every two women above the age of 45 have had an abortion. Inside the church, one out of every two women above the age of 45 has had an abortion. But we never hear that talked about. Inside the church, under the age of 45, one in three have had abortions. But there are very few and far between ministries coming out of the church to people that have had abortions. Statistics say that 3.9 million girls from the age of 11 to 19 this year will be pregnant. 3.9 million girls from the age of 11 to 19 are going to be pregnant this year. And I'm not going to ask you for your hand, but how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you were pregnant, out of wedlock, and scared to death? If grace was applied to your life and it got you through that time and you are now sitting here at the age of 40 going, Whew, thank you, God, for your grace that got me through. I'm so glad that's over. What about the 3.9 million girls that need to hear how you got through? What about the 3.9 million girls? What about the girls in the schools and the girls in your neighborhood and the girls that may even come over to play with your own children? What about them? I'm glad that grace got you through, but according to the Word of God, we receive grace packages to get us through problems so that we can go back into a dying world and say, look at what I've done, look at where I've been, but look at the Jesus that brought me through. I'm so sick of a church that won't show their scars. Because when Jesus heals you up, He does not remove the scar. It's still there. And in verse 18, it says this, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. What are you tempted with? What is your greatest temptation in this earth? Did it bring you shame? So much shame that you won't talk about it to anybody. 
You won't go to your brother in the Lord. You won't even go to your pastor. You won't go to anybody because the temptation that the enemy has assailed you with is so much that it brings you so much shame that you are in the closet with the enemy and he's beating the dead lights out of you. According to my Bible, it says that we suffer temptation so that we can aid those who are tempted. Some of the greatest ministries on this earth are ministries that have found their purpose out of their pain. Triple X Church is one of the greatest ministries I believe is out there. Triple X Church is a site for pornography addicts. And they're also, this year and next year, going to set up a 24-7 church in Sin City on the Strip. And you know who it was started by? A bunch of guys that once struggled. But the great part is, is they're not afraid to tell people, this is where I've been. You know why? Because when they allow Jesus to take the sin, they also let him take the shame. And if you don't let God take your shame, shame is the only thing that will shut you up. I'm here today to tell you some of the greatest grace packages you'll ever receive are the ones that almost led you to death or that led you into temptation that so much had you in its grasp. It's nothing to be ashamed of. God allowed you to walk through that time in your life for a purpose. And if you don't turn around and go back to those that are lost and hurting just like you did, then you've received your grace in vain. Pastor, I would love to see Churches rise up and all come to that place where they receive healing deliverance. They receive the forgiveness of the sin, but they also allow God to take the shame. And out from among the church, we start seeing ministries popping up from the misery of their life. Because if there's something God wants to do in the church, He wants to take your misery and turn it into a ministry. He wants to take the pain of your life and turn it into purpose. And He wants to take the heartaches of your life that once held you back. And He wants it to be your heartbeat to reach people. If you don't do that, you've received your grace in vain. Would you bow your heads with me? This morning I'm so thankful that God has brought me to where he's brought me. To Berea, yes. But to this point in my life that every day I say thank you, God, for the sin. Thank you, God, for the temptations of my life. Thank you, God, for the darkness and the death that I've experienced in this life. Because it was there that I found that you're a real God, a tangible God, and a God that loves me. Now, my greatest desire is to be able to share that greatest burden of my life is that you too could get to the point where you could go back into your past, the past that you would love just to avoid. You've already made it your point to wipe your brow and say, Phew, it was by the grace of God that I got through that one. But you see, God sent me here today all the way out of the storm that almost kept me there stranded in Florida. And he brought me here today, knowing that some of you are in the midst of a storm yourself. You're being assailed by temptations or sin. Or perhaps you're one that's already been through it. And you're five months, five years, 25 years away from that part of darkness and death. And you're just saying, man, I'm just so glad I made it through. Thank you, Jesus. It was by the grace of God that I'm here today. Well, that's good. I'm glad that you've got a praise for God. But now he's asking you, why are you saved? Why did I apply that grace to your life in that moment? It's so that I could use it for my glory. If you're here today and you've been through some stuff, God's urging you today to go back and look at those painful places of your life because he'd like to bring some purpose out of it. I didn't say it'd be fun. I didn't say that it would be enjoyable. I said that it's necessary.
if we're ever going to reach this dying world. If you're here today, God is speaking to you. And my prayer for your life today is that you would not receive your grace in vain. Because he loves you too much to let you go. He loves you too much to let you stay where you are. I know what it is to put one thing on the outside and to be something completely different on the inside. And today God wants it to stop. Not because he's angry, but because he loves you. If you're here today and I'm just going to get into this altar call and I'm going to ask you for hands. And I'm not asking you for hands for my benefit. I'm telling you that the way out of your situation is only one way and that's through Jesus Christ. He didn't send me today to condemn you. That's the enemy's job. That is not my job. I would not do that. The Spirit of God sends conviction though and that may be what you're feeling. Conviction is that knowing inside of your spirit that says I need to get this right and if you're here today and you are not in right standing with God that means that if you were to die today I'm asking you would you make heaven your home and if you have any iota of doubt then your answer is I need Jesus I've got something in my life that keeps me from looking boldly into the face of God knowing that He is my God and that He is with me. You see, sin will cause you to duck into bushes and to hide from God like Adam and Eve did. But you have the ability today to jump out from those bushes, raise your hand and say, Here I am, God. Here I am. I messed up. You'll remember that God walked through the garden that day and he didn't say, hey, Adam and Eve, get out of those bushes. I want to reprimand you. When Adam and Eve fell in this sin and they partook of the fruit of the enemy, they went to ducking into bushes because they were all of a sudden afraid of God, afraid that he didn't love them, afraid that they would be, he would be angry at them. But when God showed up in the garden that day, what did he say? He said, and you can read it in Genesis 3. If you don't know the story, it's powerful. God showed up on the scene in the garden and all he said was this, where are you? You see, God knew full well where they were. He wanted them to examine where they were. Today is the Holy Spirit from heaven examining your heart of where you're standing right now. And he's asking you, where are you? Are you in right standing with God? If you're not, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. Let's get it right, right now. In the midst of a bunch of sinners saved by grace, let's get it right. Are you here right now and there's something that stands between you and God? If that's you, nobody's looking around, nobody's going to judge you. Either look at me or stretch up your hand. Do you need Jesus this morning to wash you away the sins of your life, to cleanse you from the impurities? Come on, are you here today? Don't walk out of this house receiving your grace in vain. Thank you for your honesty. I want you to know that he's not angry at you today. He's not angry. Hear me, please. He's not mad at you. He's not angry at you. He loves you so much to leave you in the condition that you are. He wants you free. And sin has a way of binding you up that you're not free. He died on a cross for you. The other thing I want to ask you is this. Are you here today and there's been some grace in your life that you've received in vain? Maybe God's brought you through something and you went and said, thank you, Jesus, but you've never used it. It's never changed you. You never learned anything from it and you never went back to help anybody else who struggled like you have. If that's you right now, stretch up your hand. I've received my grace in vain. Come on, if that's you, stretch up your hand. If that's you, I've received my grace in vain. Come on. Thank you for your honesty. Come on, there are hands. Do you have the great gift of people grace? If you do, please don't receive it in vain. Every time God opens the door, bring him Jesus. Stand at the back doors of a church and help this church grow because somebody stayed just because they liked your face at the door. When new people come in and they see your people grace face, that may be the only reason they stay. Are you here today and you've got a gifting or God has brought you through something and you want him to heal you up so he can bring you to somebody to help them? If that's you, raise your hand. Come on, there's 3.9 million girls out there that need the story of a woman who was pregnant and out of wedlock and scared to death. 
There's some little girl out there that needs your arms wrapped around them. Saying, honey, I've been where you've been. Let me tell you about a man named Jesus. If you're here today and you're a teenager, you're in school and you've lost your virginity. And everything inside of you tells you to be ashamed and to be fearful that anybody would ever find out. I want you to know that there are girls in your school that God's going to send you to at the right time. He's not going to tell you you have to set up a pulpit and exclaim it to the world, okay? But he may send you to one person that needs your story. So please, tell your story. If you've been somewhere in your life, you've endured the death of a son, of a friend, of a loved one, and God brought you through it, and now he wants to bring you to people to help them to get through it just the same. God wants to use you. He wants to bring your pain into purpose. If this is for you, stretch up your hand. Come on. Come on. Thank you for your honesty. Come on. Come on. Thank you for your honesty. Come on. Some of you men have learned some things in your life from some very hard times. Some of you have been on the verge of losing a lot in your life. And God blessed you and brought it back. And now you need to turn around and help some men, some boys that are struggling just like you did. Don't be ashamed to open your mouth and tell your story for Jesus. I'm going to ask you this. If you need prayer today, you raised your hand for anything. I'm going to ask you to meet me at this altar. Why do I do that? Because anytime Jesus ever called anybody, he called them publicly. And if you are not able to come publicly to Jesus in the midst of those of us who have been right where you're at, then chances are when you get out there, you're going to struggle to be able to stand for him out there. We want to let you know that it's all right. We've all been there. Some of us are here right now. We just haven't raised our hands and admitted it. If you need prayer today, you need Jesus today, would you meet me at this altar right now? Would you? Would you do that? You don't have to be afraid of what I'm going to do when you get down here. I just want to put my hands inside of your hands and pray. I want to bind my heart together with yours, and I just want to believe that what God spoke into your spirit today is going to stick, change you. He loves you so much. Come on. A waterfall begins with one drop of water, and somebody already did the hard task of stepping out. Church, it's time to get real. And I believe there are many of you that have been right where those little girls are out there. Statistically speaking, one in four of you have been raped or molested inside of your home. Did you know that? But do you know there are very few and far between churches that are having a ministry set up for girls that have been raped and molested? There are girls right now on these church pews sitting right next to you that need somebody to let them know that they're not alone and that they don't have to be afraid anymore. But you're sitting there through it already. Just glad you're through it. And somebody sitting right beside of you is dying inside, feeling alone, abused, and hurt. They need you. Don't receive your grace in vain. Come on. If you need anything, please meet me at this altar. For the rest of you that are sitting in your, in your seats right there, would you please pray for somebody that's here up at these altars?